And I remember laying in the bed in the hospital thinking, there's no point to my life. There really isn't. Somebody came for my birthday. It was my 16th birthday and they brought me cakes and they brought me all these lovely things. But somebody brought me a picture of Jesus Christ. It just said, I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. Hey guys, have you started thinking about Mother's Day yet? Every Mother's Day, I am looking for a card or something, a gift to give my mom, my sisters, my friends. And it's hard for me to sometimes find those gifts. And so today I'm so excited to tell you about this booklet, The Mother's Might. It's a perfect, simple, inexpensive gift you can give your friends, your family, your sisters, anyone that you want to share this story with. And it will be meaningful. It's not just a little piece of candy that they eat and forget. It's something they can read over and over again because so often we, as women, feel alone and overwhelmed and burdened and like there's so many things weighing upon our shoulders. And what I love about this story is that it points us to Jesus Christ in our times of trouble, that he understands us, he loves us, he knows what we're going through and he is more than willing to help us bear that burden. And I love that about this story, that it gives not only me hope, but it will convey that sense of hope for all of you. So get your copy of it today, tamarakanderson.com slash store. You can order one, two, 10, 20, however many you want. And we will get those to you so you can get them distributed by Mother's Day. Order your copies today. After narrowly surviving a terrible auto-pedestrian accident as a teenager, my guest today knew that there might be some special purpose to her her life, although she's still trying to figure out what that might be. She married her best friend, Keith, when she found out he could sing along to her oldie songs and drop movie quotes into regular conversations. They adopted three active boys and have fostered four additional children with various special needs and backgrounds. She is an author who writes about everyday miracles. I'm pleased to present Chantel Barlow. Shawnee, are you ready to share your story of hope? I am. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is going to be so fun. So one of the interesting icebreaker facts about you is that your thumbs don't line up. One is longer than the other. One How in the world did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I I have two siblings. One has two long thumbs. One has two short. And I have one of each. And it's a super strange thing. <laughs> it's it's one of your superpowers. <laughs> I guess you have so. one that you can use for each. <laughs> yep. Yep. That is fun. Oh my goodness. So. Shawnee, this, your life has been a series of just crazy and amazing incidents that have helped you learn to trust and rely on God. Yes. And you learned that very young, right? I did. I did. I, uh, it's starting with my accident, um, I think was probably the catalyst to all. Now, of how old were you when that happened? It was right before my 16th birthday. Oh my goodness. Now describe your life before it kind of in a nutshell and how the accident changed your life. Okay. So at about 15 years old, I guess you could describe my life as completely involved in sports. That was what I lived. That's what I breathed. That's what I did every single day. That's what I thought about. And I dreamed about, I can remember watching the Olympics. I was, Uh. I still am an avid Olympics fan. And I could picture myself on that podium. I would even practice the Star Spangled Banner so that when I got up there, 
I would know all of the words and I wouldn't look weird in front of the camera. <laughs> I was, love that. That was my goal was to get there and to be a professional athlete. And at 15, that's that was my drive. Um, my accident happened right before my 16th birthday. And it happened, I was at school for a school dance. And we got there a little bit early. And it was just weird standing around with a couple yeah. of the teachers and nobody was there yet. And so we left, I had two other friends with me and we decided we wanted to just go to the store across the street. Problem was there wasn't a crosswalk there. Oh. And so we decided to just jaywalk across the street. It's been done many times before, um, right at dusk in the middle of December. And, uh, we got, we got past the first few lanes of traffic. And one of the girls that was with me, um, we were standing there in that left turn lane. She darted out in front of traffic and then a car swerved to miss her and then hit me and my other friend that were standing there. Oh no. So in a moment, I, I was hit dead center. I hit off of my arms, which crushed my, my arms, my elbows, my hands. And I flew up only to learn later that I had landed on my feet, which crushed everything downwards on my ankle, my heel, my, my knees, everything went down. And so when I woke up on the ground, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. Mm. Wow. So what did those next few months and probably years of recovery look like for you? And, and how did that affect you and your dreams and all of that? I remember going to the hospital and trying to just shake it off like any other athletic injury, just walk it off, walk it mm -hmm. off. But this wasn't something that I could walk off. This was, I couldn't even walk. And I remember laying in the bed in the hospital um, surrounded by flowers and balloons and cards and all these wonderful things, just thinking, there's no point to my life. There really isn't. And, and at 15, that was my narrow focus. My whole point of my life had been sports and achievement. And now that I didn't have that, the outlook wasn't so good. And mm -hmm. so I, I didn't see a point. I remember turning people away from the hospital room, pretending to be asleep. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to be around. Whew, I'm getting emotional. Um, somebody came for my birthday. It was my 16th birthday and they brought me cakes and they brought me all these lovely things. But somebody brought me a picture of Jesus Christ. And it's one that I'd seen before. I'd seen it in in primary classes in church and it just said I never said it would be easy I only said it would be worth it and I'd heard it before um but I felt it for the very first time in my life I felt it I knew why all of my primary teachers and church teachers would would cry when they talked about the savior because I felt it I felt like somebody knew me and and understood the pain that I was in, the physical pain, the emotional pain, and just how I viewed myself, how how low I was. But somebody understood, you know. And looking back, that was such a changing point, turning point for me in my life. I I knew that I wasn't alone, that that every time that I had been to church, that it wasn't just something that people say to feel good, that this was real, that there really was a, a heavenly father who, who cared about me. Mm. Oh, now, did you keep that little picture up so that you could look at it in the hospital room or, or, or how did that, those feelings come? Did you have to remind yourself of it regularly? What did you do? I did. I, I kept it. I still have it. Um, it came in a plastic wrap and it's almost too special to take out of the plastic. It's still in the plastic wrap. Um, but I take it out and I look at it and in the hospital, I kept it 
in my bed. I don't know how the nurses thought about that, but I kept it <laughs> under my pillow in my bed, you know, and I'd pull it out in secret and, and look at it and think about it. But yeah, it, it helped me to see other things too, that people had brought other pictures and flowers and, and see the, the intent and the meaning behind those and to feel the gratitude people had taken the time to, to do that for me. Wow. That's amazing that having a picture of the Savior with those poignant words was able to shift your perspective from my life is over to I can believe him. I, he knows what I'm going through and I can trust that he's got this figured out almost. It sounds strange. It sounds like a good plot point in a movie that all of a sudden <laughs> moment. I didn't plan it that way. I think Heavenly Father knew that I needed probably a, a little bit more forceful hit over the head, literally, to, <laughs> to figure out that that my life needed a, a little bit of a course correction, and that was the way to do it. Wow, that's that's pretty powerful. And and we wish we could say this was the only hurdle that you've had to get over. <laughs> I wish we could. I wish we could. <laughs> So take us to marriage and family. Okay. Um, so how many years later? Let me think. So that was my 16th birthday, about 20 years old. Four years later, I met my husband and I met him at work. And, and I knew that we were supposed to be together. We were just a perfect match in every way. And we still are. Um, he came from a big family. And when we talked about what we wanted to do and what our future life would look like. Of course, we talk about kids. And um, he would always say, I want a fair amount of kids. Whenever I asked him a number, I want a fair amount. And, um, and I was okay with that. We got married and we wanted to have a family right away. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And I went to the doctor um, a ways after we had been married and I brought it up. And she asked, you know, the technical questions and we began doing tests and test after test after test. Um, we found out that I have some issues with infertility, um, but we did some more tests and we found out my husband has issues with infertility. So between oh, the wow. two of us, um, it's a double whammy. of I infertility. Guess. And so we, we are not able to have biological children of our own. And I still remember that phone call when the doctor called us. She actually called me at work. She just called me at oh, work. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I, I was good on the phone, but I remember going back to the break room and just crushed, just crushed. You know, this was something that is a good thing. We want a family. We want to raise children and we want to, to them to be good people and to teach them good things. But but it wasn't going to happen. Not, not, no matter how hard we tried, it wasn't going to happen. Oh. So it almost sounds like a repetition of the, the lesson learned in the accident. You have a dream, you have a, what you envision your life is going to be like, and then it's taken from you. And this same scenario playing over, was it worse the second time around or just different? It was different in some ways worse, but it, it, different, different, because I did have that experience with my accident under my belt. I did know, and I did trust that Heavenly Father was aware of me mm -hmm. and knew about my situation, but I just didn't understand, though, you know, it felt, what if I had done something wrong? Was this a punishment? Mm -hmm. um, was this, I don't know, some something that I wasn't doing right and not even something that I was doing wrong, but something that I just wasn't doing perfectly. And I, I questioned that. Mm. Not, I didn't question his existence, but I questioned, why would you do that to me? This isn't this what you want is for us to have families and, and be happy. And, and it didn't happen. Mm. So Talk me through what you were thinking, what you were feeling, and your process that eventually led you to adoption, because I'm, I'm sure that was a bumpy, rocky road. 
It was, and adoption is a roller coaster. I think the process that got us there was, I, I have infertility issues. My husband has infertility issues. So some of the, the options out there weren't options for us. So we, we skipped a lot of the fertility um, treatments and that sort of thing. And we figured that in order for us to, to have a child, it would basically, we would need a basically a, a donor woman and a donor <laughs> husband, which is what adoption is anyways. And mm -hmm. so that was a fairly easy transition for us um, that way. It did take us a while to come around to the idea of adoption. I think for people who suffer from infertility, they have to sort of grieve those children that they had in their mind, those biological children that would never come. Mm. And it took us a, a few years to do that um, before we finally submitted our paperwork and got that ball rolling. So Wow. It's interesting that you mentioned the grieving process, because I think that's something that often we associate grief with death, mm -hmm. but there can also be grief associated with expectations that we thought were going to happen and then we don't get them yes and so I think it's so important that you pointed out that you can grieve things like I'm going to have a family I'm going to have biological children and then finding out it's not going to happen and it's totally normal to go through the anger the denial the the grief the the sadness depression almost and then finally come around to peace. And it doesn't happen right away. No. You said it took a couple of years, right? It takes a couple of years. And it is a process, just like death. It is a process. It's, it's a whole range of emotions that you go through. I remember, I don't know if I told you about this before, but I remember this vision in my head of being in a hospital room and having just given birth. I don't know. I've seen probably too many movies with this <laughs> where there's a woman and she's so beautiful and the husband comes in and he sees how beautiful she is and just the sacrifices that she's made. And there's this newborn child lying next to her and he just falls in love with her all over again. Mm -hmm. And that scene for whatever reason still makes me emotional because I will never have that. I will never have that. And so it's almost like I have to put that to rest and set it aside and say, that's okay, that I won't ever experience that particular scene, because I have other scenes that are that are opportunities for me. Mm, wow. So talk me through adoption, because I have several friends who've been through this process, and I know that it is not easy. I love how you've described it as a roller coaster, because from what I hear, it really, really is. Talk me through what adoption looks like. Okay. So adoption um, can take on a whole bunch of different forms. Depends on what type of adoption you do, if it's international or somewhere local, or if you go through an attorney or an agency. We chose an agency is what we did. Back in the day, we went through a place called LDS Family Services for my mm -hmm. first two children. Um, most agencies will review your background. They'll do background checks. They'll go through safety checks. They usually do all sorts of interviews to see emotionally, if you are ready for the changes that adoption will bring. Mm -hmm. They'll look at your finances, they'll look at all sorts of different aspects of your life. And then, then that's a process in and of itself. But when they do that, then they they give you the go ahead and you're approved for adoption. Now, each agency is different. Some mm -hmm. of them publish things online, little profiles, scrapbooks of sorts for your family and people can flip through and look through them. Um, other people encourage sort of almost a networking perspective, like know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, send something out with your Christmas cards type of a thing. Mm. Um, back then, this was the year 2005, roughly mm -hmm. for us. So the internet was um, adoption.com was just brand new. Um, now it's the biggest 
website for adoption related things, but we, we put our profile on adoption.com. Um, and we, we made an actual physical scrapbook of sorts of our family. And the agency began, I guess, marketing us to, to birth mothers and people who approached them that mm -hmm. had unplanned pregnancies. So that's, that's kind of what it looked like back then. And from there, we kind of just waited to see what happened. Mm. Talk to me about the waiting process, because often, I tell you, being in limbo is so hard. And I don't know why it is. Maybe it's because you're just waiting for an event or something to happen to trigger the next way you envision your life. But limbo is hard. So talk to me about waiting. Limbo is hard. And you hear all sorts of different perspectives as you go through your paperwork and there's classes associated with it. And you hear people say, oh, I, I submitted my paperwork. And then the next day we got a phone call. Oh, gosh. Or I submitted <laughs> my paperwork. And then a year and a half later, we got a phone call. So we don't know. We don't know. I, I still went to work every day. My husband still went to work every day. And every time that phone rang, we didn't know. It could have been changed in a minute and we didn't know. And that's kind of how it was for about a year. We had a couple close calls. We had some possible scenarios is what they called them. Um, I guess where we had been narrowed down into a a pool of just a few families that they were choosing from and they would let us know that we were one of just a few mm -hmm. and then we would get a phone call saying oh didn't make the cut you know this this baby was going to another family and and that's you know great i'm happy for that family but you know it's it's hard too to still keep moving on and knowing that you were that close but didn't make the the cut there what would you do to motivate yourself to keep going after a blow like that? Because I can only imagine that it probably was so challenging to get that phone call that, nope, you're, you're not it. What yeah. did you do? I held tight to um, one of the pieces of advice by the, the adoption workers, and that is that the right child ends up in the right home at the right time. And trusting in Heavenly Father and in God's plan for me, if that wasn't the right child and my home wasn't right for that child, then it must not have been right. And that's, I still hold on to that, that no, nope, must, must not have been us. There was somewhere mm -hmm. else that that child needed to go. Um, I had an experience in the waiting process where we were um, given an opportunity for a special needs child. This was severe, severe special needs child, mm -hmm. multiple um, disabilities and, and expectations. Um, they, they would have had a cystic fibrosis. They would have been a little person. They would have been, I don't remember, something with the breathing. And, and we agreed. We said, yeah, please consider us. But as it got down and they pared it down to, I think, two or three families, we just had this feeling it it wasn't us and it had nothing to do with the child's circumstances or their needs it was just that we weren't right and so we withdrew our names from that knowing mm. that this child had to go to somebody else in that pool it wasn't us wow well so it really so the adoption process really is a matter of not only the parent trying to figure out where does my baby belong? But it's also of you feeling out, is this child right for me? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. You are always given a choice. And you can even narrow that choice down if you would like a specific gender or race or special needs or, or anything like that. Wow. That's, that's really cool. So how long did the process take for you before you got your first baby? So our process for my first child took almost a year to the date that we were approved for adoption. Mm. And so we, like I said, we had some close calls, but it wasn't until I got a phone call one night 
um, we had just been to a family reunion and we're just getting back. And these were the days where we didn't have cell phones. And so there were, <laughs> we stopped at my parents' house. My parents were with us and uh, we dropped them off. And there were messages on my parents' voicemails at home. And um, while we were at my parents' house, we got these voicemails that from our caseworker. It says, call me, call me immediately. Call me right now. Oh, gosh. So I'm standing in my parents' kitchen and I call the caseworker back and she says, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm working. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> She's like, do you want to meet me at the hospital? Your son is there. And I started, I started crying. The paperwork had already been signed. One of my, one of my greatest fears was that I would get to the hospital or we, our family would be chosen and they would change their mind. Mm. But I think Heavenly Father knew that at least for this first go around and everything was done. All I had to do was say yes or no. And, and she's, this is about nine o'clock at night on a Monday. And she says, meet me there first thing in the morning. He's ready to go. Wow. So, and so we did. We, we ran to Walmart. Uh, <laughs> I, ran to at night. I hadn't, I hadn't prepared a nursery. It was too hard to walk by an empty nursery every day. And so we pretty much cleared the shelves at Walmart with, what does a baby need? I don't know what a baby needs. Let's just grab everything in the baby aisle. And so nine o'clock the next morning, we I had a son in my arms. So oh, my goodness. Talk me through getting that baby placed in your arms. What was that like? Surreal. Absolutely surreal. We had a the process, at least for us, looked like they brought us to an empty hospital room. They, had, they brought in one paper, one last paper to sign that said um, that you agree to this and that you agree to care for this child. And then they wheel in one of those little food cart looking things with the baby on top. And, and they, they hand him right over to me and his hair was wet. They tried to slick it down and style it all like a gentleman and um, said, here you go, mom. They called me mom. Here you go, mom. And I held him, <laughs> sorry, I held him in that moment that I wanted in the hospital, that moment that I had dreamed about having biological children of my own. This was so, so good, so comparable to anything like that. I still have pictures of my husband and I, and we're looking at him for the first time. And it is so surreal, just amazing. I can't even put words to it. Oh, Shawnee, what a sweet, sweet experience. We're going to take a quick break while we uh, dry our tears here. But when we get back, we'll have Shawnee tell us a little bit more about what the upcoming years after this held for her and her family. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Tamara K. Anderson, and I want to share something special with you. When our son Nathan was diagnosed with autism, I felt like the life we had expected for him was ripped away and with it, my own heart shattered as well. It's very common for families to feel anger, pain, confusion, and anxiety when a child is diagnosed. This is where my book, Normal For Me, comes into play. It shares my story of learning to replace my pain with acceptance, peace, joy, and hope. Normal for Me has helped change many lives and I'd like to give this book to as many families as possible. We put together something I think is really special. My friends and listeners can order copies of my book at a significantly discounted price and we will send them to families who have just had a child diagnosed with autism or another special needs diagnosis. We will put your name inside the cover so they will know someone out there loves them and wants to help. I will also sign each copy. You can order as little as one or as many as hundreds to be shared with others. So go to my website, TamaraKAnderson.com and visit the store section for more information and to place your order. You can bless the lives of many families by sending them hope, love, and peace. 
Check it out today at TamaraKAnderson.com and help me spread hope to the world. And we're back. I've been talking to Chantel Barlow about her amazing journey, not only having a bad accident happen to her when she was a 15-year-old and learning to rely on God and his wisdom, but then when she and her husband were unable to have children, um, going through the adoption process and what that looked like. And we're just to the point in the story where they had their first baby placed in their arms, their sweet little son. And so now we're to the point where Shawnee, tell me a little bit about what these next few years looked like, the challenges as as you had one, but you added more to your family and what that looked like, the challenges and the obstacles and all of that. So when I had my baby, um, oh, where to start? <laughs> um, I brought him home from the hospital and, and I had always promised myself and my husband, we'd talked about it, that if if the adoption did go through, if at all possible, I wanted to be at home raising my children. I didn't mm-hmm. want to try to balance work and home after all this stuff that we had gone through to to have children. For us, that was what worked best. And so I had just started a new job and I, I called them right away. And and I'd actually not even started the job. I'd done the hiring process. I got my name tag, my badge and everything and uh-huh. was about to start. And I called them back and said, I'm so sorry. Remember how I told you that we're adopting? Well, you know, I'm a mom now. So, um, so I, I quit my job and I was at home and I, it felt like I was babysitting. It felt like I was babysitting a niece or a nephew for a little bit. It didn't feel like this child was mine. Not immediately anyways. I still loved him and I knew it was right. But um, the transition to actually feeling like a mom took a little bit. Um, he, he had a few medical complications right off the bat. As a first time mom, I didn't understand that they were actually complications, that they weren't normal he would spit Mm. up often. And I thought babies spit up. That's what they do. But it kept getting worse and more and more. And it would not to be disgusting, but it would go across the room to the point where I would set up towels behind me whenever I would feed him or burp him. And I went into the doctor one day and the doctor took a look at him and said, this, this baby needs help and sent me on to the hospital. He had, um, a blockage of sorts in his digestive system that was pushing all the food back up. But I think it, he was about six months. No, he wasn't that old, just a few months old at the time. So he had his first surgery then that, I think that was sort of my first realization of what parenthood really is like the, the worry, the concern, the helplessness, and just honestly, the complete reliance on heavenly father for, knowledge that I didn't have. Mm. And so that was, that was challenging. But after the surgery, we were, we were great. There were no problems at all after that. That was our first introduction to parenthood. Wonderful. Now tell me, and this, this may show a little bit of, of how little I know about adoption, but do you just keep your name on the list after you've adopted a baby or what does that process look like? Do you have to completely resubmit to adopt a second child? What does that look like? It uh, Everything starts all over again. So if, if you want to adopt again, I wish we even asked that if we could keep our names on file. And I said, uh-huh. well, you know, we can keep your name here, but you still have to start all over with the paperwork and everything. Oh, wow. So we didn't start paperwork immediately. Um, my my son was about one year old when we decided that it might be time to start the paperwork again. Um, about that time, I had a dream of a little girl in in my head, and and it was so real. It was so real. I knew exactly what she looked like. I knew what it felt like to hold her, and I knew I knew she was supposed to be ours. And so I had this hope, I had this, you know, burst of adrenaline that, you know, she's the one. So we we submitted our paperwork, we went through the process again, and nothing happened. 
nothing mm-hmm. happened. And one of the trends that you'll see in adoption is that um, families without children generally get placed with a child before families that already have children. Mm. So since we already had a son, I think a lot of people maybe overlooked us, uh, completely understandable, mm-hmm. and, and placed with people who didn't have children yet. And so we waited, we waited a long time. And um, we had a couple close calls. We had a, a woman who had chosen us and, and ended up having a miscarriage. And oh. so it was, it was super early on, but um, she miscarried. And so it feels like I miscarried, I guess, in some mm-hmm. way too. It, it, I, I went through all those emotions. Um, but it was about five years later that we we didn't hear anything. We didn't hear anything. Wow. Limbo again. Limbo again. Oh my goodness! Wow. And did you just keep clinging to that dream, that hope that there were more children out there for you, or what were you thinking? Were you were you considering foster care at this point, or or what were you thinking? You know, we had considered foster care. We even went to a couple of the orientations where they just educate you on the process, but it just didn't feel right at the time. And so we Mm. just kept plugging forward with the adoption. And every year we renew our home study and yep, things are the same. And every year we'd renew our home study. In the meantime, my husband got accepted into law school. And so we, we pursued that. And in a lot of ways, I'm on I'm almost grateful that the wait was as long as it was because I can't imagine dealing with an adoption process in the middle of law school and the middle of everything Mm. else that we had going on. But it wasn't until after he graduated law school, we moved to Las Vegas and um, we were playing the tourist two weeks there in Las Vegas and walking in the Coca-Cola store downtown. And then that's when the phone rang. Wow. Again. Wow. And did you get your little girl? I didn't. I didn't. Nope. Nope. So we got a phone call um, from the agency that we worked with before. Um, a woman identified herself asking for us and wondering if this was still our phone number. And she says, the birth mother of your first son is pregnant again, years later. And oh, she wants wow. to know if you would be willing to adopt your son's sibling. And they said, you know, no, no pressure or anything, but she has an abortion scheduled for tomorrow. So oh. you tell us what you want to do, but we need an answer fairly soon. And oh so, gosh. you know, I'm, I'm standing in the Coca-Cola store saying, no, 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 please, please, please tell her to cancel the appointment. We're more than willing to adopt. Um, and I remember so we, we go about our life and that's early in her pregnancy. She can, I, we were afraid about a miscarriage. We were afraid about her change in her mind. Um, she called us, the birth mom called us a few months later when she found out the gender and she says, you're going to, you're going to have a boy. It's another boy. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. That's not the right gender though. That, <laughs> I, this must not be the one this this must not go through something's going to happen and because I know it's supposed to be a girl um but time went on and and you know she she went into labor and she called us and said get in the car and drive up to Salt Lake and and we did and and it was a boy and kind of some crazy things in the hospital when the birth father showed up but oh um but it went through and it went through just fine. <laughs> it was nuts, but it went through. Wow. So now you have your two little boys. So I have two little boys. Mm-hmm. Oh, how point. sweet. That's wonderful. Now, I, I can only imagine the pressures and the stress to not only parent, but all the the, the traumatic waiting and not waiting and all of that. How are you doing emotionally at this point? If I'm honest, after Mm -hmm. each baby, um, I went through a little bit of a depression. 
And I never realized that that could happen for an adoptive parent, you know, sort of a baby blues phase. And looking back, I see it with my first one. I reasoned that, oh, it's just the transition to being a new mom. It's not having the job. It's, you know, just the transition to being a stay at home parent. And with my second, I noticed it more with that second one that I was, I was feeling down and, and depressed a little bit and, and I should be happy. We've waited years for this to go through. And why am I not just exhilarated shouting from a mountaintop, but I was feeling kind of down. And I think it's kind of that after Christmas feeling, you know, just that happy, but kind of, kind of bummed the I don't, I, I can't describe it. There's, there's sort of a bummer aspect to, to after an adoption happens. Mm. And it's, it's true. I, and, and coupled with the fact that I'm a perfectionist anyways, mm. and I'm not doing things perfectly as a new mom just sort of gets you down a little bit. And so what I would do is I would take long walks. I would take long, long walks. And, and that helped clear my head. I did end up seeing a therapist at the time. And, and we talked about just different things, um, diet wise and exercise wise that would help. And, and I did that. And that's what helped me at the time then. Oh, so those, those are actually some really good tips for anybody who's struggling or maybe is having a down period of their life, diet, exercise, therapist, someone to talk to, whether it's a official counselor, or sometimes it's even a friend that oh, you're just completely open and honest with that um, can really help you if you're feeling down and discouraged. And and I think probably part of it too, I would say is lack of sleep. Oh, <laughs> of yeah. New moms, you know, <laughs> something about not getting enough sleep is just overwhelming. <laughs> It's true. And it it messes with your mental faculties for sure. And, and I remember friends that would reach out to me and, and ask, how are you doing? How is it going? And I would put on the face why I would put on just this fake facade, this, this, no, I'm fine. Things are great. I wish I would have said, ah, you know, today's kind of an off day, you know, and I wish I would have been more open because I think sort of keeping that inside is what simmered inside of me and and made things worse, you know, by not talking about them. Mm. But I didn't want to bring anybody else down, you know, when they ask how you're doing, you don't want to hear the worst parts of your life. But (laughs) but I do wish I had answered more honestly, though. Mm. Well, and it's interesting, because often at those times, we're praying to God, and we're saying, please help me, I'm really not feeling myself, I'm struggling. And yet he sends somebody to help us. And we're like, we're good. We're good. (laughs) But thank you. (laughs) Sometimes I wonder if God is up there just kind of pounding his head going, hello, I'm trying to help you. (laughs) I'm I'm sure he feels that way with me. I'm I'm the stubborn one. And he knows that. (laughs) (laughs) But the cool thing is that um, he just takes us where we are. And he loves us as we are. And. And uh, he'll he'll keep he'll keep trying to help us as, as long as we keep asking, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! So talk me through your third baby and then the decision to become foster parents. And I don't know what order that came in, so you'll have to clarify. So we uh, we went on about our life. We were a family of four then, you know. I mean, that's that's perfect to get on amusement park rides. That's perfect for hotel rooms. We were a family of four. And I, I began to doubt that dream that I had about that little girl for a while. I wondered if it was just a, a wish or a fancy or something that I had convinced myself about. And I went to, oh, it was a, a, a women's church activity. We were doing a dinner at the church and there was a speaker there. And I remember sitting there. I remember what the table looked like and the candles that they had there. And I just remember having this feeling, find her. Was I didn't hear an audible word, but just this feeling that I needed to find her. And I'm thinking, 
find who I don't even know who you're talking about, you know, and um, everything kind of blurred the speaker, the other women, and I had this, this picture in my head again of this little girl, find her. And I, I excused myself from the table and I went in the bathroom and I got mad. I got really mad. We're a family of four. No, we're happy. We're good. I don't want to go through adoption again. I don't want to do this. And so um, I'm sort of a reactor that way. I've described myself as the human version of Mentos and Diet Coke. I (laughs) I react. And then so I went for a drive. I got in the car and I just started driving. Heavenly Father, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to add to my family. I'm not ready for this. It hasn't been, it would only been maybe a year, not even that since we'd adopted our second child. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. You know, I don't want to do this. I don't know. You're the one who messed up. You sent me a boy instead of a girl. That was your (laughs) fault. And that's, that's how I went on for that evening. And that's kind of what simmered inside of me for a few few days um, before I finally got up the guts to talk to my husband and said, I I wonder, do you think we need to start the process again? Um, We were up against a brick wall, though, the the agency that we had gone with before no longer handled the the legal side of adoptions. And so we were going to have to start completely from scratch researching agencies. and, And now that we're in Nevada, new laws, state laws and requirements. And so, Mm. so that's what it looked like. Finally, I got around to the idea that, you know, kind of like a a tight pair of pants that you stretch in them for a little bit, like, okay, let's at least look into it. And I think we did a couple of foster orientations then too. still didn't feel right to do foster care. Um, so we did. We we found an agency here, um, a Christian-based agency, very similar to the one that we'd done before, and we talked it over with them, submitted our paperwork, and makes it sound like an easy process. It wasn't super easy, but we'd been through it a couple times. So by the third go around, it wasn't wasn't difficult at all. Mm. But yeah, submitted. Wow. Our and how did did you get her? Did you find her? You got to tell me the end of the story. <laughs> That's what my book is about. That's uh, all you'll have to find out that way. But um, <laughs> actually, so we submitted our paperwork and a few months later, we get a phone call. And what they do at this agency is they tell you the entire situation that they know about this child. We know that this child is this race. We know that they're, this is their test their scores, their APGAR scores or whatever in the hospital. This is how their health is. This is how the mom and dad are doing. And they tell you all of that except for the gender because they want you to make a decision based on facts, not on Mm -hmm. just this longing for this little girl. And Mm -hmm. so they give us this scenario of this little child that had been born. And, um, we talked about it and we prayed about it and we felt like, yeah, this is good. This is what we need to do. Um, I could have marked on my paperwork that we were only accepting girls. I could have done that. And I remember hovering my pen over that part of the paperwork. I could have circled it and I didn't feel like I needed to. I felt like heavenly father, if he's going to send me my little girl, that he would know that I didn't need Mm -hmm. to mark that. So when they finally told us that, congratulations, you have a boy, we went, are you kidding me? (laughs) (laughs) We're so grateful for this boy, but does this mean another adoption is out there? What is going on? Mm. And so we, we have three boys and that's, that's what my life looks like right now is three boys. Wow. No girls at all. Oh my goodness. But since then, you have become foster parents. Yep, still continuing that search of find her. And we we did with the foster care stuff, we narrowed it down to little girls. And we've had we've had one little boy and three girls um, with us so far. Wow. And what is it like to be a foster parent? Because I know there's emotional challenges with that as well. 
there is in a lot of ways, it's very similar to adoption, at least the process to become a foster parent. There's a few more guidelines, a little bit more rigorous background checks and, and things like that, but very similar process wise to be a licensed foster parent. But once you get there, there's far less, um, you have far less say in a lot of things. And I wasn't ready for that. You can say that, yes, I will accept this child into my home. You, you have every say in that. But when it comes to their treatment, their day-to-day, -day, um, the court determines a lot of that. The biological parents determine a lot of that. The caseworkers determine that. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm a babysitter again in a, in a lot of ways. Mm. But um, it's an amazing process. It really is. Wow. Wow. So what are the resounding lessons that you have learned through all your ups and downs of um, going through the adoption process, of having the accident? What lessons do you feel God has taught you in and through this process? And still teaching me. And still teaching you. Yes, of course. <laughs> and still teaching me. Well, well, the patience one is a big thing. I think, I think Heavenly Father knows that I seem to grow the most when I'm asked to wait. And so naturally, my the kids come to coming into my home, I have to wait for them. I think that patience helps me appreciate them. It helps me trust in Heavenly Father that. They will come to my home at the right time. Um, I don't know. It all of these experiences teach me that that God is there, just like that very first experience in the hospital after my accident. I know absolutely that God is there. I haven't. I wish I could say that I've seen His face or mm -hmm. or met Him personally, but I know just as surely as I know when somebody else is sitting right next to me that He is there. Um, I know that he cares, that even, even if I'm worried about spit ups over my shoulder or, or getting through the day on just a, an hour or so of sleep, that he cares about that. Mm -hmm. I know that he cares about these little things, um, foster care. I, I know that he cares about these little ones, even if they're just in my home for a short time. I see how he cares for them. Um, all these lessons, I, I know that there are miracles all around us and little, little messages from Heavenly Father that, no, I see you. I see you. I got you. But I, I just have to pay attention to those. It's not mm -hmm. him that's holding back. It's me not seeing what he's trying to put right in front of me. Mm. And you blog about that, right? The, the everyday miracles. Tell, tell me where people can find your blog, because I'm sure... Um, just that perspective of actually looking for things and seeing them is, is a different way to look at life, right? It is. It is. So you can find, you can find my blog right off of my website. It's shawneebarlow.com. Um, and you have that information to put that on there. Shawneebarlow.com. Just click on the blog tab. I like talking about miracles because I'm so tired of talking about politics and everything that's going wrong in the world. I would love to hear more about the things that are going right. And those don't get publicized. You know, the, there was a woman at the, at the grocery store who was just so super friendly and, and she was just bringing smiles to everybody's faces and, I, I gave her a little card afterwards. I thought that she needed to know how much I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. They don't broadcast that on the news of how nice your grocery store person was, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it needs to be there. And, and those miracles are all, all around us. Mm, I love that. Now you mentioned that one of the things you've learned to do in your life is let go. Yes. Explain what that means and why that's important. Well, um, take it from a perfectionist, a recovering <laughs> perfectionist. I wish I was in control of everything in my life. And I had a plan as a teenager. I had a plan as a young married mom. I've had plans since then. And 
none of them really seem to pan out the way that I envisioned them. And so I think what I've learned is I need to just let go and let Heavenly Father, he's got a plan for me and for my family, the person that he wants me to become, the things that he wants me to do. And the best way to get there is his way, not mine. And um, if things had gone according to my plan, I might be a retired professional athlete right now. Um, I don't know, set up in my own gym. I don't know what it would look like, but I, I certainly wouldn't be the strong person that I am today. And that's from letting him take the reins and stepping back and being, okay, show me where we're going. This, this isn't my call. So, wow. So just recognizing that God's got this and trusting that he's got that, Yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. which is so much easier to say than it is to do. (laughs) It is. It is. It takes me going back and looking through, I don't necessarily keep a journal, but I jot down a few ideas every day and, and especially thoughts or impressions or, or feelings that I have at the time I jot those down and, if I look back through that book and I see, oh, whew, that was a tough time. Look at how God got me through that. Look mm-hmm. at what he did for me. You know what? We When we moved, we couldn't find a house. Look at how he got us through that impossible situation. And then look at what he did in this circumstance. Why wouldn't he do that in this that I'm going through right now? Mm. You know, he, he knows what I'm going through. He understands it. He knows where he needs me to go. Mm-hmm. And so I just need to trust in that. So one of the things that's helped you let go and let God be in control of your life is remembering times in the past when he has helped you. Absolutely. Mm, that is, that's a powerful thing, remembering. I love that. I really, really do. Um, and it, it, it does. It, it, it's good, especially when we're struggling to remember to go back and say, how has he helped me in the past? And thinking of those things specifically and saying, okay, he'll help me again. I have no yeah. doubt. One other thing you talked about being really important um, is self-care. Yes. What does that look like for you and why is it so critical? I think things came to a head for me this last year, probably like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the the things that the pandemic brought to me was sort of this um, uh, this bottling up, this push through, keep keep going no matter what um, perfectionist drive inside me just didn't work this Mm -hmm. last year. And so I began seeing a therapist who helped teach me some healthier ways of dealing with that. And I guess in my mind, self-care was a luxury. That's mm-hmm. not something that I do. I, I do that when I don't have anything else to do, which is never, but <laughs> that's, that's how I looked at self-care, but self-care is actually a necessity because for me, I'm I'm sort of the crux of what my household does every day depends on me. So if I'm not doing well, then my household is not doing well. My kids, everything that needs to get done, it doesn't go well. So for me, that looks like um, in the mornings, I I do a little devotional where I I pray and I read scriptures and I I spend time jotting my little notes down. Um, I take some time to meditate There's all sorts of different apps and stuff that you use. I use one that talks me through it. I'm I'm not a professional meditator. I've never been to meet a a monk to teach me the the proper way to do so. But um, just being still, being still and being able to have that quiet time where I'm not thinking about what goes on the grocery list or what my boys are doing, but just being still and listening to silence or to whatever heavenly father wants to whisper to me. That's, Mm. that's what self-care looks like to me. And then throughout the day, moving, moving a lot, walking a lot, exercising, getting out in the sun. Don't not staying in my cave of a house for (laughs) that's to me, that's what self-care looks like. And then Mm. stepping away when it is too much, you know, to take a breather. Yeah. 
What is the name of that app that you use? I am curious. I use 10% Happier. Oh, I've heard of that one. 10% Happier. And I like that one because they have different meditation teachers that they talk you through what you're trying to accomplish. Like Mm. today, we're going to talk about um, being mindful of other people or extending kindness to other people. And this is why we're doing that. And then they'll go into the meditation or something along those lines. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll be sure to put that in the show notes. That's really cool. Um, Favorite Bible verse. Has there been one that has stood out to you through the years that has just resonated with you that has come to mean something to you as you've gone through your ups and downs? Yeah, absolutely. I, one of my favorite Bible verses is pretty well known, actually. It's it's in Matthew 11. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the Savior talking. And I, I feel like it's him talking personally to me. It's, it's such a, a gentle invitation. It's not saying, Shawnee, you got to come over here and work with me. It's, mm-hmm. Or Shawnee, drop everything that you're doing and get here right now. It's come unto me and take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. It's an invitation. It's asking me to do something, but it's my choice. Um, it's not saying that I'm doing everything wrong. It's not demeaning. It's not critical. It's an invitation to share that burden together Mm. because he can, he can help. He can Mm. help better than I can just do it by myself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and he's strong enough when we aren't right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because often we have days, in fact, weeks and sometimes years where we feel so weak, like overwhelmed. I can't do this, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but he's strong enough in those times. So I love that. Um, This has been so much fun. And I want you to just take a moment before we close to talk me through one other self-care tip and technique that you have used and that is writing. And you've written a book, it's in the process of being published, it's called Seeking Solace. Talk to me about how you writing was therapeutic and helpful in your self-care, but and how it also led you to writing a book. Um, It's one of those situations where I wouldn't have planned on it. I didn't (laughs) see it coming. But I had a friend introduce me to her writing coach um, through Calliope Writing Coach. And this, this is a great program that just draws the stories out of people. Everybody has a story to tell, whether it's fiction or whether it's their own story. Um, I, I got introduced to this program and, and thought it would be fun. I like to write. It would be fun. Um, but I, I started that program right about the same time I started foster care. And what that looked like was in the evenings, I would be pretty exhausted. Um, my first placement especially was a sibling set, and they were incredibly, incredibly difficult. They were abused in about every way that a child could be oh. abused. And the way that I dealt with that was I would bleed it all out onto the page any frustration any thoughts with the kids with the system with with anything just that negativity that that stress or or the good moments too the the positive you know yay we use the potty today that, <laughs> that all went on the page and so instead of letting it simmer inside of me like i had in the past it was finding an outlet and, and on the pages, I began to write about it. And I began to write about my journey um, from my accident on. And I thought about all the different patterns that I had seen in my life. You know, there are patterns. Heavenly Father is having me to learn the same lesson over and over again, and I'm still not getting it. <laughs> um, but it's helping me see 
through my writing things that I couldn't see in myself before that time. So the process was was fun that way. You know, it, it was eye opening um, writing about myself. Um, the way that this program was set up was to actually write a book and to pitch it to an agent. And so it got to that point and I pitched it to an agent and that's where we're at right now is, is in the waiting game. But um, my, my manuscript, I'm calling it seeking solace because we are still looking for that little girl and um, trying to find peace in that process. Wow. And so we'll, we'll see what happens. Wow. What, a, what an incredible First of all, resource and tip is practically free. I mean, you can either type or write on a piece of paper to vent, and it's so therapeutic. But I also found through the writing process what you were describing that sometimes it takes writing it on paper to put puzzle pieces together in your brain and say, oh, I get that now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that mm -hmm. it, it takes writing to help process some things and just look at them differently. So writing is so, so helpful and so effective. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, how can people get a hold of you? I'm sure there will be people who are like, I totally resonate with Shawnee. I love her story. I can't wait to get her book. Where can they find you online? Um, back at my website, shawneebarlow.com. Um, it also will link you to Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and some of those other social media accounts. It's all from my website, shawneebarlow.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shawnee. Any final tips before we close? Um, the only tip that I could have is, is no matter what you're going through, whether it's a tough time or whether you're in the valley between those mountains, I think is to enjoy the season that you're in right now um, and to look for those those little miracles those little messages from heaven um, tender mercies I've, I've heard them called those those things that speak to your heart that make your day just a little bit lighter um, there are things to enjoy hard times and good times so just look for those look for the everyday miracles Thank you, Shani, for being willing to take us on your journey of ups and downs and kind of all through the messy middle, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> this has been wonderful. And it's also given us a taste of the hope that you have and that you can get through anything with God's help. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.